Day 21 of Israel's war in Gaza, and Palestinians had only one piece of positive news, a fragile truce. The 12-hour ceasefire was broken Sunday as both sides resumed their rocket fire. A turnaround, though, a few hours later when Hamas announced the ceasefire, rejecting the previous one, which expired, but accepting a new one, as presented by Robert H. Seri from the United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process. Now, this truce also proved tenuous as the two sides exchanged fire. On Monday, as of the time this program has been aired, the death toll has reached 1,055 and counting. The most recent truce has had different names, a rolling ceasefire named by the U.S. or an unofficial lull or unconditional ceasefire. Confused? Well, stay tuned to this edition of the debate in which we'll discuss the different players involved in bringing about a permanent ceasefire, not like the previous ones which did not involve the lifting of the siege. We'll also, also discuss whether this war will give a rise to a third intifada, which may damage Prime Minister Netanyahu's political career as protests across the occupied West Bank have flared up in solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. This area used to host families and children who were full of hope, happiness and joy. The Israeli offensive, however, had shattered peace as well as dreams of a happy Eid al-Fitr. People of Gaza observed the holy month of Ramadan amid bombs, blood and deaths. A temporary humanitarian ceasefire gave them the chance to mark the end of it, Eid al-Fitr. We are staying in the mosques now. There are no houses left to visit. How can we visit our relatives where there are no houses to visit? This Eid is totally different than any other. We were supposed to have new clothes for dying. We have been in these clothes for five days now. The rest of the countries out of Gaza have their happy Eid and are celebrating. We have only misery and sadness. This is the worst when a child doesn't live enough to wear his new Eid clothes. The Eid is only for the children. However, Israelis' onslaught has robbed Gazans of their chance for holding a happy festival. Many families have lost one or more of their loved ones. Some, however, chose to celebrate the special occasion with them, even in their graves. But they couldn't find them where they buried them after the cemetery was bombarded. As you can see, the people here came to visit their families, found the cemetery shattered due to the bombardment, and they cannot recognize their graves anymore. Many Gazans couldn't live to celebrate Eid al-Fitr. But those who have survived the war marked the occasion in the shelters. These days are carved in the memories of the people of Gaza. The very days which are expected to be joyful now have turned into a painful memory by the Israeli brutal offensive which killed their families and loved ones. Hisham Hanna for Press TV, Gaza Strip. Let's find out what our guest thinks about uh, Operation Protective Edge, this being day 21. Scholar and activist Sarah Merizek joins us from London. And we have journalist and political commentator Maxine Dover who joins us from New York. I'd like to welcome you both. Uh, Sarah Merzak, let me start with you. As Muslims are beginning to celebrate the Eid al Fitr holiday, marking the end of the fasting month of Ramadan, obviously in the Gaza Strip it's a different story. Uh, not, not much cheer and celebrations there. The most recent attack by Israel, seven children were killed, actually nine, I should say, when an Israeli missile slammed into a playground and also a refugee camp. Uh, at this point, uh, the, Sh the Shifa hospital uh, bearing also uh, Israeli fire uh, making it uh, 22 total uh, of the 21 days hospitals and clinics to have been targeted by uh, Israel. Your reaction? Well, I just want to thank you for having me on, and I want to wish your viewers uh, Eid Mubarak. I know it's a very difficult time for everybody around the world who cares about Palestine, um, but especially for Palestinians and particularly those in Gaza right now. As you said, this is a really difficult um, Eve for them, and really they've seen their lives blown up, they've seen their families blown up, they've seen their loved ones torn apart, and we still don't know when this will be ending. Um, and as you said, Israel continues to target vital infrastructure that Palestinians need to live dignified lives. Drinking water, electricity, and hospitals. Right now, the hospitals are inundated with victims. They have so many casualties, they have no medicine, they have no surgeons to treat anybody. And right now, it's very, very difficult to get any humanitarian aid into Gaza because the Rafah crossing has largely been shut. So this is probably one of the worst eats for most Palestinians in living memory. And we are just waiting for some development, some movement from the international community to put pressure on Israel to agree to treat Palestinians like human beings, to give them the rights to lift the siege, 
to release all the political prisoners and to end its occupation of Palestine. Well, uh, a reaction from the international community, Maxine Dover, has come in the past 48 hours from uh, the UN. But before I ask you about that, uh, let me uh, br bring you up to date if you're not aware at this point. Uh, just in the past hour, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has come out and he said uh, pretty much to Israel, and of course a message to the whole world, be ready for a lengthy military campaign in the Gaza Strip. He said that, uh, quote, we must be prepared for this campaign to destroy tunnels dug by Hamas and the demilitarization of the Gaza Strip for ending the war. What can one say? The uh, network of tunnels and the infrastructure of terror that was built in Gaza is shameful. It's a network whose material, whose concrete, whose iron should have been used to be building schools, to be building factories and homes, and instead was, built, was used to build tu tunnel terrors. 800,000 tons of concrete, that's 10 times the amount of concrete that was in both World Trade Center towers. 800,000 tons of concrete was poured into terror tunnels, which killed 160 children in the building of them, as well as who knows how many were injured. These are tunnels that have destroyed the lives of the people of Gaza and were intended to destroy the lives of people in Israel. Well, uh, since you're very well uh, knowledgeable about uh, how many tons of cement, I'm assuming, was used uh, to build these tunnels. Can you tell me, please, the stats then that Israel uh, has uh, done in terms of the number of destructions of tunnels versus the number of Palestinians that have been killed, not to mention the number of Israelis, soldiers, and civilians who have been killed? Do you think that Israel would, would have, first of all, pursued this, given the death toll? And B, why do we not hear about these tunnels that have been targeted so much in terms of numbers? The tunnels uh, that I know about, and I'm certainly not on first level of knowledge, are about 64, 31 of which are, are destroyed as far as public knowledge, as far as the knowledge I have. Anyone who would equate life with concrete is a fool. No one, no one would want to see one person hurt, one person killed, one person not able to fulfill the dreams of of himself and his parents, herself and, hi and her parents. The fact that these tunnels were built simply to inflict pain and terror and death, one of them was, was mapped to come up in the middle of a dining room in one of the communities along the, uh, the Gaza-Israel border. These are not tunnels that were meant to carry cars from New York to New Jersey. They were meant to carry killers into the heart of Israel and to inflict terror. I don't think there is one person in the, in, the, in the earth who has any ethic, who wants one child killed on whatever side, in whatever society, and let alone more than one. I think that, that every parent, and I count myself among the number, feels the, the pain of another parent who buries a child. So you're, so you're convinced that uh, Israel is not targeting, is targeting just tunnels, it's not targeting, uh, at least intentionally, buildings, infrastructure, civilians uh, that have been killed? I think that Israel is intentionally targeting military targets. The fact that Hamas has demanded of people, good people who would like to live their lives in an ordinary uh, manner, that they be the host okay. of rockets, of, of military uh, materials, is what's causing the dramatic death toll. Well, that goes quite against uh, what the UN uh, Secretary General Maxine Dover has said in the past, uh, what, four or five hours. So I'm like, what do you have to tell Maxine Dover? Well, I uh, think because the UN uh, there's Secretary a lot of facts General that prove otherwise. Hold on, Maxine Dover, I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Sarah Marizek, in response okay, to Maxine Dover. Well, I would point out that, you know, ask the, the guest why these tunnels exist. They exist because Gaza has been under a draconian siege for seven years. It is 
impossible to have a normal, dignified life in Gaza as a Palestinian. And therefore, the government, the resistance has to do something in order to change the status quo because it is unlivable. Most Palestinians in Gaza would say that they have a choice between a quick death, resisting, or they have a choice for a slow death by living with the occupation, living with the siege, living unbearable lives. And most human beings would choose dignity. They would choose a quick death. And that's why these resistance, that's why so many Palestinians support the resistance. And that's why the tunnels are built, to give them hope, to give them something that they can struggle with. Now, of course, the tunnels are the also tunnels essential build, going in respond. and out of Egypt. Let me respond. It, Right, the tunnels going I, I in can't and even out of finish Egypt. my sentence. Maxine Dover, if she can finish general, her sentence, then you can go ahead. We're in general go ahead, Sarah Marizek. Maxine Dover, just a minute. Sarah Marizek is probably okay, going to answer. Okay, I'm sorry, Sarah. Go ahead. My apologies. Well, go ahead. I mean, it. Even beyond the tunnels, it would be absurd to say that Israel's not also targeting infrastructure. Why are so many hospitals built? Why are so many homes destroyed? If the tunnels were everything, actually, this is kind of a stupid conversation because Israel didn't even know the extent of the tunnels before it started the operation. Now, of course, all of a sudden, the tunnels are a big issue because Israel just wants to continue bombing Gaza. It has nothing to do. There's no strategic outcome for this except more misery, more suffering creating more Palestinians, their lives are ruined, they're going to be more determined to resist in any way that's possible, building more tunnels, coming up with new ideas. Everything comes back to the occupation, everything comes back to the siege. Give people a decent life, treat human beings with dignity, and you won't have any problems. Go ahead, Maxine Dover. Sarah, I was in, I was in the West Bank about three weeks ago. And I was on an ordinary bus going from place to place. I was in a supermarket. The staff of that supermarket is about 50% Jewish and 50% Arab. The customers reflect the same ratio. And you know what was happening? People were buying apples and oranges and saying thank you and uh, uh, greeting one another in normal, ordinary ways. That's what everybody wants. I agree with you. The fact of the, the terror tunnels is completely different than the, the tunnels that Egypt shut down. Remember, Egypt shut down the tunnels that were being used to carry goods back and forth. And why that was done was to put pressure on Hamas, clearly. Um, but terror tunnels are totally different. They're built differently. They are different. Israel was aware of the tunnel network. Gilad Shalit was taken through a tunnel. So the fact of, of awareness is something that, that was there. I think Israel did ha not have a, a, an idea of the extent of the network. Uh, probably the only ones who did were the mappers and the builders. And clearly those tunnels going into Israel were not intended to carry back milk or bread. There are 200 trucks a day that are going through the crossing with Israel's agreement there is electricity and water that until this uh, horrendous time was being supplied to Gaza directly from Israel. And Israel did not shut off the electricity and Israel did not shut off the water okay. when the, this, this conflagration began. Okay. Uh, Maxine Dover, are you aware of uh, the way that uh, Israel is conducting itself right now in terms of its soldiers in Gaza Strip? Can you tell me what the Israeli soldiers are doing in the Gaza Strip? What is the purpose? The purpose is to find the military materiel, the rocket launchers, the entrances to the tunnels. Okay. Those materials and rockets that are being stockpiled for further terror. Okay. And to and eliminate them. And do you know how they're going about that? Based on an account by an ex-soldier uh, of the Israeli army, Operation Cast Lead 2008, he said in order for the Israeli soldiers during that time to find out, as you said, rocket launchers and perhaps uh, some of the fighters, what they would do first is they would kill everything in sight and bomb everything in sight, which causes a huge amount of civilian casualties, including residential homes. Are you aware of that? Are you okay with that? I can't comment. I'm not aware of that. Oh, that, that was the comments made by the Israeli soldier. Let's get your reaction I'm on that, Sarah of, I'm not aware of the, this commentary that you refer to. I, I, you could refer. Give you, I could give you the website. I could get, it's plain. It's, it's, in, it's on the net. Basic search on that would uh, provide you with that. And there's plenty there to prove the comments made there by 
this uh, ex-Israeli soldier. Sarah Marusek, your comments on that? Well, I just want to go back to the, the point that our guests made regarding the Palestinians in the West Bank um, living together with Jewish Israelis. And I just want to point out that those Palestinians cannot vote. They do not have the same rights as Israelis. So we cannot paint this rosy picture of some coexistence when there's an occupier and an occupied. And I think that's essential when it comes to discussing anything in Gaza, because in Gaza, Palestinians do resist. They are punished for it, but they do resist. And resistance is a legitimate form of struggle when you are being occupied. It's not a form of self-defense to an attack an occupied people. It is oppression. It is against international law. And the soldiers are currently destroying everything Sarah, in Gaza. No There's Israelis children. In Gaza. Sarah, there are no Israelis in Gaza until 20 days ago. This was completely Israel free. That's what I'm referring to. The Since Israelis Israel, are currently in Gaza destroying Israel everything. Israel unilaterally. Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza. There were no Israelis in Gaza for nearly a decade. And why occupation did Hamas isn't just about soldiers the on the ground. It's about to build. There were no occupying. There was no occupation in Gaza. Hamas was in charge. Why did Hamas not build houses? Why did they build terror tunnels? Why did Hamas destroy the greenhouses and the factories, the, the wonderful produce factories that were left intact? The Wolfenson Foundation paid millions of dollars for functioning agricultural factories, greenhouses, that were supplying Europe with marvelous fruit. Why was that not continued? Why were they torn apart? Why were, were rockets stored in UNRWA schools? Why did the, the Secretary General not uh, compliment Hamas on, on storing the rockets, but rather cite Hamas for the, the horror that it's inflicting on the people by storing rockets in schools. Why did the Secretary General talk so one-sided at the uh, last presser that he had, Maxine Dover, and pretty much uh, said some of the comments being, uh, as the world marks aid of unconditional humanitarian ceasefire in the name of humanity, Netanyahu, please stop, honor the ceasefire. Uh, Israeli missiles have plummeted the Gaza Strip. Massive Israeli assault has devastated the lives of Gazans. This is the U.S. Secretary General. You can listen to the presser. It's probably on, the, on YouTube by, by this point. Scenes of indiscriminate fire is, again, uh, about Israel. Whole neighborhoods leveled. Scores of bodies still buried under mountains of wreckage. That's the U.S. Secretary General. What do you have, Maxine Dover, to tell Ban Ki-moon when he made these statements? I would tell Ban Ki-moon that if anything can be done to rectify, first of all, the damage that's already been done, and yes, there has been horrendous damage done, then the world should work together to work with Israel to try and rectify this, to re help the, the people of Gaza, not Hamas, but the people of Gaza, rebuild and rebuild for their lives. And remember, I repeat again, there were no Israelis in Gaza since the unilateral withdrawal under Sharon. Okay, uh, we're going to give we're going to give Sarah Marizek the last minutes here. Sarah remember Marizek the, uh, from remember London. That there was uh, the a part, possibility of the heart of the Gaza problem, as you mentioned, in, is the occupation. Singapore That's also in the West Bank. The Sudan. Okay, uh, Sarah Marizek, you pointed uh, the heart of the problem lies in the occupation. It lies on the fact that this land is uh, filled with Palestinians that obviously want their peace. They want uh, what's entitled to them. Uh, so how can we? How can this, can this come about through the situation that's happening with Gaza to bring a wider, for perhaps, peace, peace to the occupied Palestinian territories, do you think? Well, I think that what's happening in Gaza is actually going to encourage Palestinians to launch a third antifada, and we've seen this over the last few days. Palestinians are sick and tired of negotiations that increase occupation. There are more settlements. There, you know, we talk about building tunnels. Well, why are Hamas building tunnels? It's because they don't have the right to have an army. How is it possible to have a sovereign state but not be able to defend yourself? It's just absurd. So basically, all of these accusations against Hamas, it's, it's set up to make them into terrorists. But they're not terrorists. They're resisting. They're, given, they're doing the best that they can to defend their people, to try to liberate their lands, liberate their people, and really 
the international community is starting to wake up to this. You know, the United Nations is not doing very much, but people around the world have been protesting in the streets by the millions in support of Palestinian rights in support of Palestinian rights. That means we will not support the occupation any longer. We will demand that the occupation ends and that Palestinians can live freely with all their rights and all their dignity. Thank you very much for that. That was scholar and activist Sarah Merzek talking to us from London. And thank you very much, Maxine Dober, political journalist and political commentator who spoke to us from New York. Thanks for watching another edition of The Debate from Ikawa Tawai and the entire team here in the capital, Tehran. It's goodbye.